Hey, it's Dave Asprey with Bulletproof Radio. Today's cool fact of the day is that humans have evolved to have larger skulls and we like to think anyway, smarter brains. It seems like a pretty good idea, except for the way that your skull makes room for your larger brain is by using less bone here in your jaw. So what that means is it's harder for us to eat tough food, which is fine because that's why we have ribeye. On top of that, our teeth have stayed the same size, even though our jaws are smaller, and that's one of the reasons that you can get impacted wisdom teeth, just because your brain's too big. You could also say it's because your mom or your grandmother ate grains, which can also cause impaction of your teeth. Today's guest has been on the show quite a while back, and it's my great pleasure uh, to introduce a guy who I, I really consider a groundbreaking exercise guy. Uh, this is Dr. Doug McGuff. He's an ER doctor, He's an exercise geek and a weightlifter, and he's one of those few ER doctors who happens to just have his own gym called Ultimate Exercise. And he is one of the authors of Body by Science, along with John Little, looking at what high intensity training does for you. And I've used his techniques for a very long time to support my own lifestyle, which is minimal amounts of exercise for maximum gain. And Doug does an amazing job of, of helping people to understand you know, what they're doing with, from an exercise perspective. It's been more than a hundred episodes back when Doug was on. We've met in person a couple of times and I'm, Doug, I'm just stoked to have you back on the show. Awesome. I'm really glad to be here. Hey, uh, my uh, wisdom teeth, they came in no problem. I think my brain must be too small. <laughs> <laughs> That's too funny. You don't have wisdom teeth problems is because you're dumb. That, that should be the headline. <laughs> I thought I had to study more than most people, but you know, oh well. You, you did something right. Uh, because you've come up with some new stuff. The reason that I, I wanted to catch up with you, aside just to, to get an update, because I know you're constantly researching this stuff, but you've been looking at myokines. Yeah, it's kind of my new um, obsession these days, and I certainly didn't come up with it. I stumbled across some of the research about it, and it kind of, you know, there were always these things that, uh, you know, I just believed but could not prove. Um, and the myokines is kind of starting to fill in a little bit of that black box for me. What the heck is a myokine? I'm sure everyone driving right now is just wondering, what is this? Yeah, a myokine is basically just a chemical signaler. Um, the, the more generalized term for that kind of molecule is called a cytokine. And there are all kinds of cytokines that do chemical signaling, endocrine signaling from one organ to another, or paracrine signaling within a single organ. Um, to kind of direct the body as to what it should be doing at any given moment. Well, they've recently discovered that skeletal muscle is not just this really great tissue that contracts, makes us strong and able to move, but it's actually one of our largest endocrine organs in our body and it signals to other tissues in our body in a very meaningful way. And Art Devaney kind of a long time ago made mention of this concept that the tissues in your body don't necessarily all um, just work together in this harmonious fashion necessarily. Um, in a lot of ways, body tissues compete with each other. And a lot of this competition takes place through cytokines. And specifically, body fat and muscle tissue have cytokines, these signaling hormones that work in opposition and in competition with each other. And how you eat and how you exercise can give the competitive advantage to one side or the other such that reaching optimal health, optimal body composition, even optimal um, neurological functioning can be augmented by tipping the balance in favor of one versus the other. So what are some of the most famous myokines? Like I, I know a lot of cytokines. I, I, I monitor inflammation and a lot of the biohacks in the Bulletproof Diet book are around, oh, look, you can lower this specific inflammatory thing with this nutritional intervention or sleep or stress. But myokines are a subcategory of cytokines, correct? Correct. And the most of the myokines that have been studied um, are actually cytokines that have an anti-inflammatory effect. And much of the myokines will have an anti-inflammatory effect that directly opposes 
the inflammatory effects, a lot of the um, inflammatory cytokines, probably the, the longest known and most deeply understood myokine is one called interleukin-6. And that myokine is liberated from contracting skeletal muscle, particularly when it's doing high-intensity work, but pretty much in any sort of muscular activity, it is released to some degree. And it is actually, as the intensity of exercise rises, it's released in an exponentially greater degree because it is done by an amplification cascade, meaning that when it's triggered, two molecules will trigger four molecules and four molecules will trigger eight and it just amplifies very quickly. So that, that's a beautiful biohack because what you're saying then is by modifying the intensity of your exercise, you're uh, basically exponentially increasing the amount of an anti-inflammatory substance in the body? Correct. Um, it, oh. it has this anti-inflammatory effect, but it also has neat biochemical effects. It um, very aggressively upregulates the uptake of glucose into the muscle cell and glucose utilization and glycogen mobilization. It also ramps up lipolysis, so mobilization of fatty acid from stored body fat, and it's ramping through the cell through the mitochondria to do beta oxidation of fatty acids. All of that is augmented and ramped up by interleukin-6. Um, other things that it does is it uh, stimulates the release of nitric oxide, which causes vasodilation, increased blood flow into the skeletal muscle, but has a more long-term effect of modulating blood pressure towards more, more optimal levels. Um, and it actually acts as a leptin surrogate to increase insulin sensitivity. So it has, just this one myokine has so many beneficial effects that we are looking for. And that's the thing that I always intrinsically felt about high intensity strength training is that it was so much greater than the sum of its parts. There seemed to be something more going on in terms of body composition than could be accounted for simply by the energy that it used. You mean exercise isn't just to burn calories? Yeah, no. <laughs> so th this is this is fascinating because nitric oxide has been uh, really identified as a signaling molecule in the body that we didn't know that much about even would you say five years ago uh, as a major signaler. It, it just sort of popped up. Yeah, and I'm. You know, let's see, interleukin-6, it's, there's probably been, it's probably been known about and some research done on it for the past 10 years. Yeah. But the interest in it has gone up exponentially. And the neat thing for me as an exercise geek is, you know, over, you know, I started doing this stuff back in the 70s. So I've always been an exercise geek over the long span of time. And what I've noticed is that all the major advancements in exercise physiology don't come out of exercise physiology. They come out of cell biology and biochemistry. Amen. Yes. <laughs> Freaking geeks that have never exercised in their whole life. When they find something that's relevant to exercise, then you really got something. There's very little that comes out of the exercise physiology literature that really has an effect or changes anything at all. But when, when it comes from some biochem geek, man, you, you're onto something big. Uh, everything that you just said, uh, um, probably, I, I'd say in my experience, I'm not certain that it applies to muscles, although I think it's pretty darn likely in my experience, but you focus on that more. All of the brain training and cognitive stuff that I've worked on, the same exact statement about when you change something at the cellular level, everything above it, including the way you think and your ability to pay attention, all of that changes. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to send you, uh, I think that September 10th, I'll have like my early things, a new mitochondrial thing. We're, we're calling it a whole body nootropic called unfair advantage. Uh, it's, it's the single most exciting, uh, new supplement I've done as important uh, to my own performance now is bulletproof coffee that upregulates your mitochondria and, uh, uh, just basically you can feel it within five minutes of taking it in a big way. So I, I'm predicting there will be like new world records set from people using the stuff because just like you said, what it, what happens when you fix something at the cell level, it just goes throughout the body. So I, I've, I've honestly never been more excited. So we'll, we'll I'll send you a box of the stuff. It's not even available for pre-order yet, but it's when it comes out, everyone's going to talk about it. 
Well, that's you know that's cool. And here's here's another thing about the interleukin six is it is an anti-inflammatory molecule, but it's not just the effect of the molecule; it's the effect of its receptors. So it's not only anti-inflammatory, it's pro-inflammatory in terms of its receptors. So if you're generating lots of interleukin-6, then you upregulate interleukin-6 receptor sensitivity. And when that happens, it has that pro-inflammatory effect of, um, actually I'm saying it backwards, more interleukin-6, you downregulate the receptors. The fewer receptors you have, the less inflammation you generate. So oh, not wow. only is the molecule anti-inflammatory, the downregulation of its receptors is anti-inflammatory. Yeah. So it's it's kind of a double whammy with the production of these cytokines. Now, now I'm, I'm inherently a lazy guy. I call it strategic laziness, uh, where like, I'm not lazy because I don't want to do the work. I just want to do the work faster so I can do something else that's more important. Couldn't I just like get a IL-6 nasal spray or inject the stuff, downregulate my receptors, and just not even pick up something heavy? You know, I'm betting <laughs> that there are pharmaceutical companies working on that right now. Now, there, there are genetic manipulations that can be done to increase or decrease your production. A lot of the research that's been done on how interleukin-6 is based on kind of like taking it away from experimental animals, and the way they do that is by a genetic manipulation that produces an interleukin-6 knockout gene, so that you basically, wow, you know, the DNA is just a big series of bases, you know, cytosine, adenine, guanine, and it's this little code, and if you just frame shift the code a little bit, whatever transcribes that particular gene will, will now become garbled nonsense, and then the animal doesn't have interleukin-6 anymore, and then in an animal devoid or severely hampered in the production of that hormone, you can figure out exactly what it's doing. Wow. What about gut bacteria? Do they make IL-6? Is, is there a gut biome component to this whole thing? That I don't know. And that's my other big fascination uh -huh. that I'm way behind the curve on is the whole you know, intestinal microbiome. Um, and I'm certain that it has some sort of interaction, but I've not really tweezed that out of anything that I've read so far. I, I, like I say, I'm just kind of scratching the surface of this stuff, but it's it's pretty cool stuff. It it's uh, it's remarkable how many of the different cytokines are in some way manufactured by the gut bacteria to the point that in the the research that I've been working on on the the Bulletproof Diet book, I, I'm like. These little bastards, some of them are good for you, but a lot of them are there, they're hacking your system. Like your body has its own regulatory system for inflammation. And then these little things sit in there and they say, oh, we wanted you to be more inflamed or less inflamed for our own nefarious uses, which is mostly keeping their life support system alive. So uh, I, I'm, I'm intrigued to see what happens when we look at both high intensity exercise plus gut biome. And is there some group of people who work out really hard but have a bad gut biome and either it doesn't work, because that was my experience. An hour and a half a day of heavy lifting for half of it and heavy cardio for the other half, I couldn't lose weight. Granted, I was overtraining like, like crazy, but I weighed 300 pounds and I was desperate. And I, I'm certain in retrospect that my gut biome was a part of the whole equation, but you know. Yeah, and I think that's probably going to turn out to be true and it'll probably be true in a feed forward kind of way in the sense that if you're doing proper training and it's high intensity and it's brief enough and you should be able to recover from it, if you're one of these people has trouble with recovery or you're just totally hammered for two days after a workout, I'm highly suspicious that the answer might be that somehow your gut microbiome is disrupted. Uh, but in the feed forward mechanism, I think the delivery of an appropriate exercise stimulus may release those myokines in such a way that drives behavior towards reestablishing a better gut flora. Um, so I think that both can benefit the other and both can harm the other depending on what you're doing. I think if you're someone that's going to chronically overtrain, that clearly um, gut inflammation from ischemia related to overtraining marathon runners um, can really disrupt your gut microbiome and in that process turn you into someone that's just 
a poor exerciser and poor yeah. recoverer. Uh, my uh, my little memory trickle bookmark was was accurate. I, I just pulled it up. Uh, there's a study from actually ten years ago where they were looking at the effect of MCTs, you know, the, the stuff in Brain Octane and, and the MCT. Um, that when you combine that with a bacterial toxin, in other words, you have bad bacteria in the gut. That only in that case in rats that MCT changes the the uh, secretion of interleukin-6, the primary myokine we're talking about. So there's an interesting thing from what you eat based on the toxins made by what's growing in your gut changes your, your inflammatory profile, basically how you respond to it. It's so complex and it's so amazing that what you're talking about, which is we'll just downregulate your receptors by lifting heavy things sometimes, it seems like kind of an elegant way to get around a lot of this complexity. So even if you have a problem with your gut bacteria, you're, you're still getting less of this problem. Yeah, the more I read on this, that's the cool thing about all this complexity is all of that complexity and all of these feedback loops um, seem to benefit us by making what we have to do very simple. All that complexity and all that adaptability means that we just have to have a few gross heuristics to operate within in order to optimize everything and all the complexity of that will take care of it for us. And Doug, that's one of the things I, I really like about your perspective. Like, like you, you dig in way more than most people would because you're an exercise geek and because you have a little bit of training that went into <laughs> your medical degree. <laughs> so you, you have this, this way of thinking, this body of knowledge, and you've gone in at that level on, on exercise, which lets you make those basic heuristics. Like uh, one of the questions I'm sure people have got to be asking themselves, You've talked about the benefits of lifting heavy things to basically downregulate your IL, to upregulate the production of IL-6 and downregulate the number of receptors you have so you'll have less inflammation. But how often do you have to do it? Well, um, that kind of depends upon the individual and the recovery status at any point in time. But the more we look at it, if someone is interested in optimizing the results, you really don't have to do it that often. And over time, I really, you know, I really like working out and I will yeah. do it as much as I can get away with, even though I'm a huge advocate of appropriate recovery and, you know, doing very brief workouts infrequently. Um, so to answer your question, I think it is always in exercise, a great idea to strive for a minimal effective dose. Um, because exercise is pro-inflammatory, okay? If you are a person that is not living life right, not eating right, burning in both ends of the candle all the time, you have to understand that the exercise you're doing, at least in the acute phase, is adding an acute inflammatory event onto a chronic inflammatory state. So when you're making this transition from, let's say you're finally going to say, look, I'm going to take care of myself. I'm going to live life right. It's most important for that person um, to do exercise in a way that invokes a pro-inflammatory state but does it in a way that allows you to make that transition without chronically heaping more and more stress and inflammation onto a chronically stressed and inflamed body. Minimal effective dose is a great way to do that. As a 52-year-old guy who has no major injuries from training over the longer term, it's also important because really what you start to find out as you experiment with all these different ways of training is that all the extra crap that I did through the years didn't make a difference. And that actually the best results came when I truncated and minimized my training and really paid attention to recovery and diet and <laughs> things on the recovery side of the equation. Yeah. I mean, you can, um, I mean, you can get the hammer and pound the shit out of the nail. Um, but if you really tune the, the recovery side of the equation, you don't have to hammer and hammer and hammer. The training becomes a nail gun, <laughs> not a hammer, you know? What a, what a beautiful analogy. And I, I wish someone had told me that when, <laughs> when I was 20 at the gym, seven, you know, six, seven days a week. It, it was, 
it was exactly what you you were describing. I didn't understand. You know, you, you should recover like a demon, <laughs> not exercise like a demon. You know, and I don't know if a younger guy will ever listen to that. You know, I mean, um, so much of having to be tough in your youth just has to do with the fact that you're just fucking stupid. <laughs> you know, and you just need to be tough because you're stupid until you get to have accumulated enough lumps to actually become smart. You know, I, I've got a five-year-old boy and a seven-year-old girl, and I got to say, maybe it's just the fact that he's a boy, but I mean, I'll, I'll tell him, it's going to hurt if you do that. And then he looks at you and he does it anyway. You're like, well, it, it's a learning experience. And, you know, we, we've got, you know, we, we, we've got iodine for that or whatever it is, but it's, it, it, it's funny because it continues. And we know the prefrontal cortex really finishes, kind of solidifies around 24, somewhere between 23 and 24. Uh, so during that time, you know, it, there's a whole set of these behaviors that are kind of subconscious that come out. And I, I kind of, the, I beat the crap on my body. I had, I have a screw in my knee and three knee surgeries before I was old enough to have my prefrontal cortex all the way in, right? Because I wouldn't listen to my body. And I, you know, I also, I was doing things that were supposed to be good for me that just simply weren't. And that's one of my motivations for what I do now. It's like, well, like, why don't we just do what works? Because... I was strategically lazy when I was under 23. I'm like, if I don't have to do it, I don't want to do it. Uh, but I just thought I had to do things that were actually bad for me. So that, that's kind of a noxious thing. And you're saying, though, that you like to exercise. Uh, so you work out as much as you can get away with. Now, I, I get clients like that. Um, when I do coaching, and with the, the Bulletproof Diet book coming out, it's getting to be harder and harder to do one-on-one -on -one coaching, but I, I still make some time for this. There are oftentimes like type A career CEOs, uh, celebrity types, so they're working really, really hard. So not enough sleep, frequent travel. They also want to be Ironman athletes, <laughs> right? So they want to do some seriously intense stuff. And then you look at their, their blood panels and they're like clearly CRP is high. Uh, their HRV, the heart rate variability is all not right. So classical overtraining. So then you tell them, well, look, you need to like back off a bit. And then they sort of look like you like they're going to cry and they say, but I, I need my exercise. It makes me feel good. And there's some opiate addiction there, but there's a comfortable line between like having to beat yourself up every single day. Where do you draw that line for people who want to exercise more than a minimum effective dose? How do you know if it's too much? Well, the way I tell people to assess it in themselves is if something comes up in your day-to-day -day life on a day when you're scheduled to work out, and if something interferes with that and you have to cancel it and move it to another day, if it freaks you out <laughs> or if it pisses you off or if it ruins your day and you're in a foul mood the rest of the day or you can't stop thinking yeah. about it, you're doing too much. That is the weird thing about the overtraining syndrome is it is a form of OCD. It's like telling someone with OCD, stop flicking the light switch, man. It's not good for you. Well, yeah, but if they don't, they're going to feel enormous angst over it. And that angst is the signal that you're there. <laughs> um, and, you know, this is why I like your concept of strategic laziness, because that's what we evolved out of. We want the most results for the least effort, because in the evolutionary environment from which our bodies evolved out of, that was an absolute necessity because there was really severe scarcity. Now in the age of, you know, the modern age where, you know, capitalism has provided so much abundance, we got a mismatch of that. But um, yeah, I find that amongst hard driving executive types that you service is this whole Johnny Quest mentality <laughs> that, you know, I'm going to work 16 hours a day. I'm going to travel all over the world. Um, and, you know, I'm going to run marathons, do ultra endurance and events and climb mountains and, you know, all this Johnny Quest crap. But um, in the end, what you end up figuring out is in order to be superhuman, you have to realize that you are only human. And when you have accounted for that, and followed the biologic imperative to cover and take care of yourself with the appropriate nutrition and the correctly modulated exercise, it's then and only then that you really do feel superhuman. 
Yeah. Um, and I think that's a big, big key in all this. And it's a hard thing to get these hard driving individuals to understand. It, it's really something I didn't understand, but, but resilience is itself a practice. And no one's like, you know, good job, Dave. You know, you were really resilient. It's like you were strong and you didn't give up. And bottom line is giving up is one thing. Deciding that you've had enough and that you need to recover now so that you can get up again the next day and do it over is just a different skill. And it's not one that we praise. It's not one that we train. And it's not one really that, that you're likely to know about unless you've hit the wall really, really hard a few times. Yeah. I mean, I, I just was watching a, um, a Vimeo clip. And an interesting thing is, you know, you talk about a Navy SEAL or Special Forces type people. Those people are put under a huge amount of stress, both as a weeding out process, but also as stress inoculation yes. to make them. But what they found is in all of their stress inoculation training, the one thing that decreased the washout rate at BUDS from 38 down to 23% was one simple thing. And that was to teach combat breathing which is a oh. meditative form of breathing where you, when you're freaking out and you need to slow your heart rate down because once your heart rate goes above about 140 fine motor control and decision-making capacity, just goes to crap. And what they did was they taught these guys how to meditate and how to breathe. Four seconds in, hold four seconds, four seconds out. The box breath. <laughs> yes, the box breath training and learning how to meditate, that alone proved more valuable in terms of stress inoculation and making it through the BUDS course than all the other, you know, more traditional stress inoculation techniques that they had done. So, you know, stress inoculation is a good thing and it's good to challenge ourselves and do big things. But again, that whole, you know, realizing you're only human to become superhuman is important. Um, there are elements of self-care that make you able to handle those stressful moments. And as an emergency physician, it, you know, it's taken me, you know, I've had a 25 career in this, including residency, so, you know, 22 not, but a long career in emergency medicine. And as going from a new ER doc to an old ER doc, one thing I've really come to realize is that the answer to dealing with this uncontrolled pace, overwhelming pace, and, and sick people and dying people is not to get yourself all amped up on Red Bulls and all hyped up and crazy. <laughs> you got to have an ability to calm yourself, to be the eye of the storm in order to function truly well. Now, you can kind of get yourself through it when you're not as good as you should be, by, you know, drinking Red Bulls and going ape crazy. Um, but the better way is to have that kind of calm. It, it's funny you mentioned the, the medical side of things. I, uh, I've learned those meditative breathing techniques and all the 40 years of Zen neurofeedback and all that sort of stuff. So I've learned to calm myself even at, at in, in an ER, which used to always be terrifying. And I made a commitment to training my kids the same way. So both my kids play uh, the, the heart math game, the, the inner balance sensor, they clip the little thing on. And just last night, uh, Anna, who's seven, was running and she tripped on a stair and landed, you know, skinned all four joints you can skin at one time, you know, screamed and, you know, it was a disaster. And she sat up and literally did four full slow in, slow out breaths stopped crying, picked herself up, and decided that she wanted to go into the forest before we cleaned up her wounds. <laughs> and, and I was like just flabbergasted to see this because just teaching those basic skills, I mean, what would happen in the ER if, if everyone who came in with whatever kind of critical injury they have knew how to breathe like that? Like, do you think more people would survive? Um... I don't want to put you on the spot. You know, I, I know you have licensing issues or whatever, but... Well, well yeah, no, you're talking about... Uh surviving, I kind of suspect that it might be because one thing that we found is that in critical care patients, someone that is, you know, a bad multi-trauma or someone with bad sepsis that you have to put on the ventilator, that 
if you don't provide appropriate pain control and anxiolysis, that their mortality is actually significantly higher. So if you have a big dumping of catecholamines during an acute injury or illness, your survival is actually worse. Um, we try to manage that pharma pharmacologically and through medical intervention, but you know, now that you ask the question, someone that was able to access their own physiology, like in my opinion, every human being should be taught to do, Yes. if they were able to do that, I think it could make a real difference. And, and probably not in some cases. But. People that you know, are under acute stress, their ability to manage their own physiology can save their life in a critical situation. But certainly, I think it could also diminish the likelihood of developing PTSD during a stressful event or something. Because all of these, um, you know, this big dump of catecholamines and inflammatory cytokines, I think has a long-term effect for setting the stage wow. for those sort of bad things. So, yeah, I mean... I, I've not thought this out ahead of time before you asking me, but when you ask me that, I think, yeah. Well, you you know what you know what you're doing because uh, according to my friends over at the HeartMath Institute, I, I'm an advisor for HeartMath um, and just a, a friend and supporter of of their kind of technology. Uh, they've looked at that, and people who are trained in heart rate variability before they go into combat are less likely to get PTSD because they can get out of fight or flight. And it, so it, it's funny that you predicted that based on your knowledge from an ER. In fact, that's startling that you did. Funny that you asked me that because now when I think back about it, right now I work, you know, I've, for the past 20 years, I've worked in a high volume, high acuity community emergency department. But when I was in residency and you know, we rotated amongst different big hospitals. At the children's hospital, they had a specialist called a child life specialist. And per my recollection, when their children were in painful or stressful situations, they would come in and they would actually talk them through breathing exercises and things for self-calming. And it really did make a significant difference. So I think, you know, we do this for kids. Why don't we do this? you know, for everyone and for adults. And that's probably something that could be applied in the emergency medicine setting that would be beneficial for a lot of people because, um, you know, I, I tell you, I got the sense that on any given shift, on any given day, 40% um, of what I see is driven largely by anxiety states. <laughs> So, so now here's an odd question, and then we'll go back to some of the other exercise-related stuff. Could could you set a ventilator to do box breathing? <laughs> yeah, you can. Does it calm people down? You know, I don't know. I'm so intrigued. <laughs> you can set a ventilator. Mostly what we manipulate ventilator settings for is to um, to do three things. One is to control the level of carbon dioxide that's circulating in the blood by how how well you're blowing off carbon dioxide, to what extent. The other is to affect oxygenation of the blood, and third is to provide pressure support for when the lung is ill, when it's got fluid that's causing the alveoli to collapse and things of that nature. So mostly the ventilator, ventilator is tweaked to optimize um, acid-base balance in the blood and to optimize cardiac output. Um, but to answer your question, some critical care specialist that's very adept at manipulating, you could. Wow, I, I'm so intrigued. What we're finding with ventilator settings is used to, I mean, 10 years ago, we would run much higher tidal volumes um, and respiratory rates than we do nowadays. Now the tidal volume has gone down significantly, and um, the level of oxygenation and respiratory rates have been modulated somewhat. So um, I guess in some sort of sense, that would be the ventilator, ventilator version of, of that kind of uh, approach. Well, let's take that back to exercise. Uh, given that you know so much about blood gas mixes, more than anyone uh, with a degree in exercise physiology is likely to, um, you, uh, have you applied that to exercising in oxygen tents, high altitude, low altitude training, lifting heavy things without any air, stuff like that? No, not really. Other than 
the thing with breathing and exercise is the same thing that we were talking about earlier with the complexity of myokines and gut bacteria and how all this stuff feeds back is that if you're doing really hard work, the best ventilatory mechanism that you can use is the one that you don't think about because it auto-regulates very well. When you're doing hard, high-intensity exercise, you start to generate a lactic acidosis from the production of lactic acid. Um, and the automatic response is that pH is received by the chemoreceptors in your carotid arteries and around your brainstem automatically regulates your respiratory volume and rate to blow off carbon dioxide to affect carboxylic acid in your bloodstream to normalize the pH relative to the lactic acidosis. And that kind of auto-regulates. Go ahead. Looks like you're going to ask. No, it, it's, uh, it, it, there's a whole school of, of training, mostly for uh, endurance guys around, you know, live high, train low, and, or vice versa, depending on stuff. And so I've been, for the past uh, almost month or so, uh, getting my blood oxygen levels very short intermittent phases down into the high 70s for up to six minutes at a time. So I'm, I'm in the middle of, of basically trying to raise my EPO levels naturally um, for as an anti-aging technique. But I, I've noticed huge differences just in how I feel uh, after just a few days of that. And it's shown to improve athletic performance, but it, it's fascinating to look at high intensity exposures to really heavy exercise, which you just figured out with some of the latest research you're doing, what it's doing to myokines and the number of myokines you have. It appears you can do the same thing with cold, cold thermogenesis, the same thing with blood gas levels. So there's all sorts of ways to like reach into the body and give it a strong signal to make it change, even though that's a signal that might never have really occurred for most people uh, in, in a normal way of living. So I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued that we're gonna find a lot more there. Yeah, oxygen is a whole different ball of wax than carbon dioxide monitoring for the body because how oxygen is moved around the body is through hemoglobin, which is a really cool molecule. It's a tetramer. It has four binding sites for oxygen. And it changes its chemical shape as it binds oxygen. So if you have a tetramer with four binding sites and you bind one oxygen, the remaining three binding sites attract oxygen more aggressively. And then you bind the second one, the third one, and the fourth one now bind more aggressively. When they're all four bound, hemoglobin holds on to oxygen very aggressively. So a lot of people think of optimizing their oxygenation means having better oxygen binding, and that's not the case. What you need is oxygen delivery. The hemoglobin molecule has to be able to let go of oxygen at the tissue level. And at sea level, when you chronically have good high levels of oxygen, you're always binding oxygen aggressively, and it's hard for the oxygen to let go at the tissue level. Things that can augment letting go of oxygen at the tissue level acutely are lactic acidosis and signals that there's tissue hypoxia. That changes again the shape of the hemoglobin molecule so it lets go of oxygen more readily. On a chronic basis, when you train at altitude or you do what you're doing, you're actually upregulating a molecule called 2,3-diphosphoglycerate. And that is a molecule that changes the shape of hemoglobin over the longer time span so it binds oxygen less aggressively. Really? So that means you are able to let go of oxygen more easily at the tissue level. So what you'll find is if you train at altitude, you return to a more normal sea level, what you'll find is that your oxygen saturation, rather than always being 99 or 100 percent, you'll be at 95 percent. So someone that's trained in a hypoxic environment produces more 2,3-diphosphoglycerate, and they therefore bind oxygen to the hemoglobin molecule a little bit less aggressively and are therefore more able to let go of oxygen at the tissue level and pass oxygen from hemoglobin to myoglobin in the muscle where it can be utilized. So you're increasing the bioavailability of oxygen to your muscles? Correct. Oh, that's... By, by actually holding on to it 
less stingily. Doug, I'm so glad I asked. I'm so glad I asked you that because no one's ever explained that to me, uh, and I don't even know that molecule, so now I have to go look it up. And the cool thing is, if can you see me on the screen? Yeah. Uh, although people who are in their cars won't, but a lot of people are on YouTube, right? Well, I'll try to describe it verbally. Yeah. The oxygen binding curve for hemoglobin is sigmoidal. It starts off very flat. And then as oxygen level rises in your bloodstream, when the partial pressure of oxygen is about 20, your oxygen saturation is going to be 50, 60 percent. As the partial pressure of oxygen rises to 30, 40, and 50, you get on the steep part of the curve that goes up. Once you get a partial pressure of oxygen of about 70 or 80, your oxygen, I mean your hemoglobin molecule will be about 95 percent saturated. And then you can drive oxygen up to you know, partial pressure of 200 and you're not going to get, you're still going to just bottom out at 99, 100%. So the shoulder where you go from really tightly bound oxygen and fully saturated hemoglobin is at about 95%. So someone that's trained in a hypoxic environment will sit right at that shoulder uh. so that they can drop off onto the steep part of the dissociation curve really quickly. So that person lets go of oxygen more aggressively at the tissue level. So a lot of people, when they do this and they put the pulse oxygen, they're like, damn, I'm only 95% on room air. This isn't working. <laughs> what that really means is that it is working. You should be running around 95 96%, not 100%. <laughs> and they think, I'm getting worse when they're actually getting better because you're binding oxygen less aggressively so you can deliver it to tissue more easily. Serendipity is awesome because I put on my, my pulse oxygen monitor um, and, and it, was, it was just at 96 and, and I was like, God damn, literally it, was, it happened to me like 30 seconds ago because I was, I was like, yeah, I've been monitoring my blood oxygen. I, I wrote about what happens to it when I fly and I've been playing with this for years. And then I'm like, I guess all the stuff I'm doing, first time I saw a 96 during the day and uh, I hear it as you predicted that. <laughs> is that more is better. Yeah. But when it comes to hemoglobin binding, you want to bind the oxygen less aggressively. So most people that are well conditioned will float around 95, 96% okay. cuz they let go of it easier. Oh, that's beautiful. All right. Let's get back into exercise. CrossFit and functional movement. I mean, what's what's your take on, on I mean, it's clear the intensity is there and it seems like minimum effective dose isn't going to give you the benefits of proper form that you would get from like a functional movement training. Um, what, what's your take on that from a body by science perspective? Uh, you know, I, I don't ever want to be a guy that comes across as a hater. And yeah. in that context, I go to the CrossFit website every day and I look at it and I like their sense of life. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. I think there is enormous value in doing hard things. I think that's cool stuff, okay? Um, the whole functional movement craze um, is a little off-putting to me because I think it's overplayed, okay? The human body, if it's appropriately strengthening and conditioned, is functional and can get into most positions pretty well. Um, but I don't think you have to construct a major training component dedicated exclusively to that for that to be in place. Now, my beef with CrossFit from the body by science perspective is two things. One is that for most circumstances and most people, you have crossed the threshold way beyond minimal effective dose. If you follow the wads and you do, you know, what's going to be going on at most boxes, um, you're going to be well beyond minimal effective dose. And what that does for CrossFit from the marketing standpoint is it creates um, the fitness version of SEAL Buds training. Is you kind of get rid of all the people that are not intrinsically tough enough to handle it or don't have that genetically gifted recovery capability to begin with, you kind of weed out the weak and you're left with the strong. So it's a great marketing strategy for getting people that respond well to exercise. But it certainly greatly oversteps the minimal effective dose concept, which I'm a big fan of. The second thing is I think they need to rethink 
a lot of the different, you know, wads that are named after women. I can't, I don't even know what they are. But I think it can be a real problem when you take a highly complex skilled movement pattern and mix it with exhaustion. Because motor skills, like we said before, motor control degrades when heart rate elevates above a certain point. Complex motor skills degrade with exhaustion. So, you know, when you're going to put a 500 or 2,000 meter row and 100 burpees before you do some complex Olympic lift, I think that's a prescription to mess yourself up in a big way. So you're worried about the injury, the injury side of it. Yeah, okay. and not, you know, and body by science, super slow, a lot of the high intensity world, we are way, way on the other spectrum of safety. That We, we invoke so much safety that um, our margin of safety is almost ridiculous. I mean, Ultimate Exercise has been open since 1997. We do 120 workouts a week. We never had an injury in facility. Where is your facility? Um, plug it for a minute. Where, uh... We're in Seneca, South Carolina, All right. which is right next to Clemson University, if anyone's familiar. But um, so we have this huge margin of safety. So I'm not saying that everything that they do is unsafe, but I, I think there are certain combinations where you're begging for it. I mean, if you're really doing something that's highly exhaustive, that's stacking a lot of fatigue and a lot of lactic acidosis, and then you're going to do a going to do a complex motor movement in a state of exhaustion, that's when you're going to drop the bar on your neck or on your back, and or you're going to lose control with it going overhead and tear your rotator cuff or get a slap injury. Um, you know, I, I think some of that probably. Um, needs to be rethought or people that are doing it well um, are probably arranging things in a way where that doesn't happen. So, so the, the composition of the wad really matters for CrossFit. I, I hear you there. I, I, you know, and that's, that's their, that's their product and that's their business. I'll let them handle. I got my product in my business. Yeah, I, I don't think I, I, neither of us is dumping. Yeah. I love anyone that values doing hard things. I think it's cool. Yeah, and I even have uh, Kelly Starr at, uh, at come to the Bulletproof Conference uh, to speak, you know, and he's, he's doing some of both. So I, uh, I'm, I'm a supporter of it, but man, if you're gonna train that hard, you better recover just as hard. And, and a lot of the, the techniques that I've worked on are good for recovering resilience whatever kind of your stress is. And if you're working out, you know, six days a week, your physical stress is pretty high. So let's hope your emotional and job stress aren't so bad. And <laughs> is the way they market themselves, you know, with all the, the military devotion and, you know, all the workouts named after dead soldier, the whole Johnny quest special forces things really appeals to the type a executives that you've spoken about earlier. And, um, that can really just throw gasoline on the fire of the OCD over accomplishment leading to overtraining problem that we talked about earlier. Uh, so it, it's, uh, it, it's something that I, I think is here to stay that's super high intensity and, and it feels good in the community. And so there, there's a lot of good stuff going. And I, I hear what you're saying there. Uh, the, the concern about injuries because me, I'm, I'm actually grateful that I, that I walk relatively normally because, you know, that after my third knee surgery at 23, where they put a screw in my knee, they sort of said, well, you know, be grateful that you're walking. And for me to have gone from constant knee pain in both knees to being able to track the Himalayas for months, uh, even though my knees hurt some of the time, <laughs> to be honest, it doesn't matter. I could do it. And it was within you know, my capability and I didn't have an unstable knee or anything. So, wow. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a cool point that, I've noticed over the years, both in the emergency department, seeing patients and in the training facilities, I see a lot of people with bunged up joints, bad knees, osteoarthritis. But the people that are doing high intensity muscular work can have a knee that by radiographic criteria is horrendous osteoarthritis. But they're asymptomatic, they don't have pain. Wow. Whereas someone that is not doing exercise that challenges muscle in a meaningful way, those people have 
osteoarthritis with inflammatory changes and significant pain that limits their activities of daily life. And I think it has a lot to do with this myokine stuff we've been talking about. One of them, uh, interleukin-15, has a big systemic anti-inflammatory effect, mainly by the fact that it antagonizes truncal body fat, which is the major distributor of all these inflammatory cytokines. But it also has a direct anti-inflammatory effect as it circulates through the body. And that's one of those things that I observed but could not explain that I think myokines might explain, and it might explain why you got this knee that's full of hardware, but it doesn't really bother you that much. When, if you looked at it on x-ray, anyone in their right mind would go, oh, shit, hey, that dude's hurting. <laughs> you know? I, that may be the case because I, I did not know you were supposed to be able to walk without pain until... Uh, sometime in my mid twenties, like, wow, I actually did. I played soccer for 13 years. It hurts to run. It hurts to move. That's just like the condition of life. Uh, and granted I, w I had extreme inflammation cause I was exposed to some biotoxins and, and whatnot. Uh, and I ate like crap because we didn't know any better. So, you know, mistakes were made, but still it, it, looking at all this IL six, IL 15, IL eight, like all the different interleukins, uh, and all the myokines are, uh, it is, it's been revolutionary for me and you've studied them more, much more so than I have. I've looked at which supplements and in some cases, which forms of things like, uh, cold thermogenesis are going to downregulate inflammation because I'm like aging is a war against inflammation. So how do we win? Uh, um, but are you going to come out with a book on these? I, it seems like it's about time. Oh man. Um, that would be cool to do. Um, you know, the next go round, you know, I'd like to do another exercise book that incorporates all of this sort of stuff again. Um, yeah, I, I probably will have to do that. It's not definitely in the plans right now because there's just so much other crap going on right now. Um, but yeah, especially as my understanding of it delved deeper. But the cool thing about it, it it's kind of the cool stuff about what you do is that all of this complexity and all this stuff that you can really geek out on, the neat message behind it all is that if, you know, you just follow some simple heuristics and, you know, just do this, um, then all of that takes care of, it, takes care of itself. That complexity is there to make it simple for us. It, it's funny. I did not know half the reasons Bulletproof Coffee worked. I, I experimented with this idea of, of putting butter in because it had to be better than the other crap that's in cappuccino. And because I felt really good, I just noticed it in Tibet. And as I wrote the Bulletproof Diet book, I, I kept coming across research. I'm like, oh my God, like someone actually did this study and they found the same results that I kind of noticed in myself, but I didn't know there was any science behind that. So I was able to, to kind of geek out and find reasons that I was getting effects that should not have happened according to my expectations, but, but did. Yeah, and that's, that's the thing over the years, experimenting in the gym that, and reading and you know, communicating with other people that are experimenting, I started to see the pattern because everyone thinks that science always precedes invention and innovation, but it doesn't. Invention and innovation <laughs> precede science. And then we give science something to fill all this science that's coming out on high intensity exercise was preceded by 20 years by guys like Arthur Jones and Ellington Darden and people that were looking into high intensity exercise and, you know, the just um, intrinsic intuitive, man, this is really good stuff. That preceded any scientific investigation into why it worked. And what I'm really starting to understand is that there's something that precedes innovation, and it's called tinkering and farting around. <laughs> you know, this farting around and tinkering with shit leads to innovation, and then once the innovation expresses itself, then some scientists are like, hey, what are these guys doing over here? Let's study it. That's the way it goes. Science never precedes innovation that I have ever seen. Yeah, you, you look at observation, a little bit of hypothesizing, experimenting, and then you really come in with, with the hardcore stuff. Uh, I, I just funded some research uh, looking at inflammation, uh, and it's, I just paid for the IRB approval for a study. And it, it's funny, it's an observation that I've made that, that 
I'd say thousands of other people have reported to me, but no one's ever studied it in a systematic way. So like, okay, what, well, we're going to like, either, either the number, the inflammation numbers are going to go up or go down according to a set of practices and that sort of thing. There's no real economic incentive for much of this, like high intensity, who's going to benefit from doing the study on high intensity exercise, like some new, you know, some new gym or something maybe, but, but it, it's not like it's a big pharmaceutical company. So I, I'm really looking, I'm looking forward to more like quantified self happening. You know, I mean, I have this book that's called body by science and I have been dogged by people for a lack of scientific rigor in some of the stuff I discuss on the internet and on my blog and in videos and with you and you've got <laughs> a lot of crap because guys like us, what we're doing is, I mean, we throw dog shit at a screen door and see what lands on the other side. Yeah. But when some stuff lands on the other side, then, oh, the serious scientists come pick that stuff up and run with it. And it's like, oh, yeah, you know, but, but really, I mean, that willingness to kind of say this works for reasons I don't understand and I'm going to keep doing it even though I can't prove it is enormously beneficial. And sometimes the proving it part of it doesn't happen for 20 years. So you yeah. don't have time to wait around. Yeah. It, aging, aging doesn't wait. And you know, I, I'm not planning on, on dying because I was waiting for a double blind study that said dying was bad for me. I, I, I... <laughs> I'm 52 tomorrow. I go to take, my board every 10 years you got to recertify for your board certification in emergency medicine tomorrow i go take my second 10-year certification which means the last time i took it i was 42 and i literally feel like it was two weeks ago that i drove down to the testing center and did it <laughs> wow so you know the thing is is in our day-to-day -day lives the days are long but the years are short and we don't have time to you know mess around with this stuff. I mean, we just got to get on with it and do things. It, it's, it's totally true. And I got to say, if you're watching and you're, you're looking on Skype, I mean, you don't look any older than I am and I'm 41. So you're, you're doing something right. And I, I look odd today. If anyone's noticed me sitting here with my eyes closed, um, I, one of my eyes is fully dilated because I had an eye exam right before this. So I've been kind of like squinting and looking funny the whole time. So oh, yeah, I look like <laughs> Satan. <laughs> now, uh, Let's see, I've got two more questions for you. One of them is, have you looked at inflammation or muscles and whole body vibration at all? It, it seems like there's another whole set of like hacked, hacked warm-up kind of stuff going on there. And full disclosure, I, I have the whole Bulletproof vibe. It's a very small part of what I do. But, you know, and this uh, is the second time someone's really pinged me with that. Um, I, was, I had an interview with uh, Joseph Mercola a while mm -hmm. back, and he pinged me about it. And it triggered me just enough to... Um, kind of hit PubMed and see, you know, is there any literature out here about that at all? And, you know, there, there seemed to be a mother load of it, but yeah. I've not delved into it yet. You want me to send you one for three months to play with? I'd be happy to. Oh, do. sure. Yeah. All, all right. right. It's yours. Yeah. The, the Bulletproof vibe is awesome. I, I stand on it like probably between this and my next uh, interview, I'll go stand on it for two minutes just to get the lymphatic system going and circulation and all. Yeah. But, um, but to answer your question in any real sense and able to be able to comment intelligently on it, no. Okay, cool. Um, but it, it did pique my curiosity enough just to kind of go, oh, let's look and see what the literature like. It's like, there's a lot. So, it, yeah. you know, it's just, you've got to be read. So it, it goes back to that that whole kind of strategic laziness, minimum effective dose. And, and I, I'm a big believer in movement. And, and one of the things I love about your book, Body by Science, is that like, look, taking the stairs is movement. It's not exercise. So you're not getting a hormonal response. So sometimes I don't have time to go for a walk, but I still want my body to get, you know, the, the movement that happens. So if I can accelerate that into a smaller period of time, like it's maybe inferior, but it's better than nothing. So I, I tend to look at it like that. And you know, it's, it's not exercise, but I think that kind of stuff is important because one thing I'm also becoming a big believer in, and the myokines kind of feed into that, is the concept of signaling. I've always found that when I spend a lot of time walking, long distances, hour or two walks, uh, go on long walks with the wife, I'm always leaner. Yeah. And I don't think it's because of any exercise effect or calorie burning effect, but I think it sends a biological signal that says, look, if you're going to be moving around that much, the diminishing marginal utility of carrying stored energy on your body <laughs> is too high. I mean, it's, it's cost is too high. 
I mean, sure, you got, you know, two weeks of stored energy, but the cost of carrying around all that crap is too much if you're going to be moving around that much. So the biological signal adjusts behavior in a way that allows you to be leaner. It's not that you're burning calories or 10,000 steps a day burns a certain number of calories and that's crap. <laughs> it's laughable. But I do think it sends a biological signal that says the marginal utility of having stored body fat is now um, diminished. So I, I think we uh, we would both agree that there's got to be something going on there. Uh, same thing. It, it doesn't make any sense because you burn you know three potato chips worth on your long walk if you're really looking at calorie burn. But yeah, you you feel better. And I, I always assumed it was something to do with the muscles' effect on lymph. You increase lymph flow. Maybe you have more ability to burn uh, to burn fat. I, but there's clearly some little mechanism that we probably yeah. I think there's just that. so much going on inside that black box that yeah. you know we just got to be happy with what comes out the other side. Well, there, there's the other question I really wanted to ask you is something uh, that I think would benefit readers. Bulletproof exec is relatively complex. So there's a bunch of like, come here, start here kind of stuff. But, but really, there are people who you know, really get into the weeds and there's a lot of weeds there that you can get into it if you want to really go up and do something. When I go to bodybyscience.net, you've got a lot of complexity on there too. And I want to know how are you dealing with that and where should new people who want to go and check out your website, where should they go to start looking at your recommendations? Because honestly, you've got tons of stuff on research there. Like I, I find it a useful resource. Yeah, I mean, that's a great place for, it's more of a gathering community for geeks like me that want to come there and geek out. Um, I actually have a website that I run most of my consultancy through that has um, a direct link to the to a YouTube channel that's got some good videos and lectures and things of that nature, and, that, and that's just Dr. McGuff, D R M C G U F F dot com. So Dr. McGuff dot com. If you go there, um, you can see all the stuff on consultancy. But there's links on you know learn and watch and stuff like that where you can go and pick up some of the um, lectures that I've given that have been recorded that really kind of parse it down into the essentials. And, um, you know, it can even be much simpler than that. And it's, you know, you have a great visual analog thing for diet that I think is just a great heuristic to operate by. Thank you. My heuristic for diet is this. Um, and, and for exercises, do something really hard every once in a while and remain active otherwise. <laughs> Hold on, that's too hard. Let me write that down. <laughs> so do some really hard stuff every once in a while and remain active. Diet is this. If you draw a straight line between the sun and your body, then that's a good diet. And it can be, your diet can be you getting directly in the sun and converting vitamin D3 and probably a lot of other hormonally active substances that we don't even know that, about that come from direct sunlight. Or the sunlight acts on phytoplankton or the sunlight acts on plants that go through photosynthesis. You can eat those like Terry Walls advocates. Yep. She's a good friend. Or there are animals that eat those plants and you can eat those animals and you can move <laughs> up the food chain. But that food chain is a chain that connects between you and the sun in a straight line. When you deviate off that straight line through processing, that's where you get into trouble. So... A diet that stays on that straight line tends to be a single ingredient diet. You know, you don't pick up a box and it's got 40 ingredients that you can't pronounce. You pick up a, uh, what am I going to eat? I'm going to eat an egg. What's an egg? Egg. What's an apple? <laughs> apple. What's in broccoli? Broccoli. Yeah. Single ingredient diet, straight line between you and the sun, and that works out. But the heuristic, that little uh, analog thing, you know, good, better, best, you know, for each of the different macronutrients and stuff, that's a great gross heuristic. And I think those are the things, those gross heuristics that simplify everything so that you can do it without having to devote so much mental energy to it. So you can go on and do the more important things yeah. in life. Um, and I think that's really key. Uh, I, uh, I, I think we have a similar way of thinking because I, I think you really boiled it down in your book. Same thing when I read that. I'm like, oh, like I, I don't need to know all the details here. I, I'm you know, more about 
feeling really, really good, having a ton of energy, having my brain work all the time and looking reasonably good. I'm married. I have kids. Like I don't have to have a chiseled Hollywood 6% body fat. In fact, I would probably die sooner if I did like most people who look that way. Uh, so the, the whole point there is like the goals are a little bit different, but when it comes to exercise, I know you've gone two levels deeper than I have. Uh, and I look at your, yours, like, here's the five things you do and do them about this often with about this level of intensity about there. And you're not too perf perfectionist about it. Love it. Like that's, that's perfect. Yeah. I, I mean, there's a letter of the law and I love digging into that, yeah. but the purpose of the letter of the law is so that you can operate with the spirit of the law. If you do that, you're 95% of the way there and the rest is just icing. Awesome. And, and if you just want to geek out, it's there for you. Well, it's, it's time to test your memory because a hundred and so episodes ago, I asked you this question and I want to ask it to you again. It's the final question uh, in the interview. And what are your top three recommendations for people who want to perform better at life? So if you want to kick more ass, do these three things. It doesn't have to be anything to do with exercise, whatever else, but you've, you've learned a lot. You've, you, know, you have an interesting career. The three things that everyone should know, and we're going to test and see if this matches what you did before. Not really. There's no test. There's no it test. It won't match because I've seen your other interviews and I, <laughs> and I saw the question. I thought, what do I want to say this time? And it's probably going to be different than what I said before. That, that's actually not, good. Yeah. Sh it's not going to relate just directly to exercise okay. or, or physical aspects, but life in general. Yes. And this, you know, because I'm studying for my emergency medicine boards third time around this time, uh, the renewal every 10 years it gets me thinking about things in a more global sense. And in the global sense, my three things for kicking ass in life are number one, just show up. Just show up. That's 90% of it. You know, whatever it is, just do it. Just show up and be there and you're on your way. Okay. The number two thing is imagine to actually if there's something you want to do, some way you want to be, being able to imagine it in your mind sets the stage for it to happen. You give your brain and your mind a target to focus on, and that starts with imagination. And then once you've done that, the other thing is rehearsal. And just rehearse it in your mind over and over and over again. There's certain big things that you have to have worked out in your mind ahead of time. So you know what your course of action is going to be because when the shit hits the fan and you're freaking out, you got to be able to go there. Okay. When I go to work in the ER every day, when I'm driving into work, I rehearse three things in my head. One is to do a thoracotomy which is where someone's been shot in the chest. They arrive in full arrest. You got to open up their chest, um, open up the sack around the heart, evacuate the clot, save someone's life that's been shot or stabbed. And the other is the procedure of a cricothyrotomy, which is getting into the windpipe for someone who has had massive facial trauma or is having an allergic reaction. Their tongue's so swollen that you can't get a tube into their windpipe by the usual route. You have to do it surgically. And the third is a postmortem cesarean section. A pregnant woman that's beyond 20, 24 weeks gestation that's had a cardiac arrest. Within five minutes of cardiac arrest, the only way you're going to save the mother and the baby is to cut and get the baby out. And the thing about emergency medicine and the thing about so many things in life is the greater your need to act quickly and decisively, the greater your tendency to hesitate. And the only way to overcome that is rehearsal. So think about the big important issues in your life and how you're going to behave when those things happen and rehearse them and rehearse them every day. So when it does happen, you'll know what to do. When you're on the 114th floor of the World Trade Center and the instructor, I, well, they told us just to stay put until they give us instructions. If you thought it out ahead of time, you'll be the guy that says, screw that, I'm going down the stairs. <laughs> um, you know, when someone holds you at gunpoint in the parking lot of the shopping center 
and says, get in the car, you'll be the guy that says, I'm not getting in the car. You can shoot me right here in the parking lot in front of all the cameras. There's all sorts of things. You've got to pick what they are. But whatever these big issues in your life that you foresee coming sometime in the future, think about what you're going to do and rehearse it. And those are my three secrets to kick ass. Well, those are definitely more impactful than the last ones because I'm not sure I remember them without going back to look at the show. But I think I'll remember these, Doug. <laughs> so so when... that wasn't that. Uh... Uh, rapidly scrambling here on my computer trying to find the old episodes. So. <laughs> I would have been sad if you said the same ones because people can always listen to the first interview. And, and by the way, you should. If you enjoy this one, uh, the first interview was, was good. We talked a lot more in that one about you know, the basics of exercise and all. But Doug, it's, it's always a pleasure to have you on the show. Would you toss out uh, drdougmcguff.com and uh, bodybyscience.net? Any other URLs besides those that people should go to? I think that will get you to everything that is sort of a portal to what I do. So that's Dr. McGuff, drmcguff.com, and bodybyscience.net, and you can find me from there. Wonderful. Have an awesome afternoon, and thanks again for being on Bulletproof Radio. Yeah, um, send me a copy of that book. I want to see it. It's coming. All right, awesome. You've probably heard me talking about whole body vibration on one podcast or another, but if you haven't, check out the Bulletproof Whole Body Vibration platform called the Bulletproof Vibe on UpgradedSelf.com. Upgraded coffee beans are something that I created for the highest possible mental and physical performance. It's coffee that's processed differently than other coffee. It tastes even better than normal coffee, but it gives you a very different mental feeling 